Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, How to Accelerate BI Responsiveness with Data Lineage, sponsored today by Octopi. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom middle of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And again, to access and open the Q&A or the chat panel, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me, me introduce to you our speakers for today, David Lotion and David Bitten. David Lotion is president and knowledge of knowledge integrity, is global rec globally recognized as an expert in business intelligence, data quality, and master data management, frequently contributing to Intelligence Enterprise DM Review and the Data Administration Newsletter, tdan.com. David Bitten has extensive product knowledge coupled with creative ideas for product application and a solid history of global sales and marketing management of software as a service and internet driven products. And with that, I will give the floor to David Lotion to start today's webinar. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. And uh, thanks to, uh, to Dataversity and to Octopi for, uh, for inviting me to uh, speak on this topic. Uh, it's a topic that I've been familiar with for a long time, although uh, uh, what we will see as I uh, walk through some of the slides is that is that uh, the perceptions of the of the value and the utility of data lineage have truly uh, accelerated over the last couple of years, and that's contributing to to great uh, value that can be provided to to accelerating BI responsiveness. So to to actually to start off, I, I think it's actually really good to begin uh, a talk about business intelligence response responsiveness by reflecting on on a historical perspective about the use of information for decision-making and, and, and uh, an interesting kind of side note, recently I've been doing a lot of reading about, uh, about information value and decision-making and, and going back over, over decades of, of articles and research papers and, and magazine articles, et cetera, about information value. And many of them, uh, if not all of us, all of them reflect what, I, what I've got to hear this quote from, uh, from this article called The Value of Information that was written in 1968 uh, that says, ideally, information is the sum total of data needed for decision-making. Uh, and when I read through a lot of these, these papers, there's some common themes that appear uh, uh, over that five-decade-plus span about data usability within and across the enterprise for the purposes of making good decisions. And these are namely what I show on this, on the right side of the slide, information awareness or knowing what data sets exist and could be of value for decision-making and, and, uh, uh, and business intelligence information availability, uh, which is basically the knowledge about whether the data sets that, that are, are available for use and under what circumstances or restrictions uh, are, are in place for using that information. Information trust or the degree to which that data in those data assets are trustworthy. Uh, accessibility or how that information is made actually made available, how I can get access to that. Uh, information currency and information freshness we are both looking at at the the uh, 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 how frequently data is refreshed and whether it's kept up to date. And then the uh, the last item there is information format or whether the data is in a format that can be easily used. And I think that anybody who's worked on on any kind of uh, data warehouse, data mart, uh, data visualization, reporting, analytics, any of those those types of of applications is intimately familiar with some of the, the, the issues that arise from, from any one of these items. Uh, but organizations that have traditionally used a data warehouse have attempted to finesse these issues by creating a set of well-defined data extraction and data preparation pipelines. But as we will see, this tightly structured, uh, the traditional data warehouse architecture uh, is, is, is gradually disintegrating. and and I think what 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 we'll discuss is is how the uh, the the traditional or conventional approach to 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 populating data into a data warehouse is is beginning to be uh, 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 no longer the uh, the status quo. So if you look at this picture in a conventional data warehouse, uh, there's going to be well-defined data processing pipelines. And data is 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 being extracted from 
from existing operational or transaction processing systems that are typically known sources that are well within the corporate data center. Uh, the data is extracted usually in managed batches. Those data sets that are extracted are, are then typically moved to some kind of staging area, sometimes to an operational data store where that data is then processed, it's, it's standardized, it's cleansed, it's transformed, it's reorganized, it's then prepared for loading, it typically in, a, in all in batch uh, into this target data warehouse. So it's forwarded to the data warehouse. That data warehouse is a single resource that's then shared by the different downstream consumers. And for the most part, uh, all these processes are are managed by an IT team or or a a small team that is the data warehouse uh, 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 guardians, you might say. So there are these well defined processing pipelines that are transforming the data from the original formats to uh, one usable uh, format for reporting and business intelligence. And there is some control that is exerted over the, those data production processes. So there's some, some level of oversight and, and control. And so to that extent, the fact that, that, that we've, we've limited ourselves to a, small, a smaller domain of sources that can be fed into a BI environment gives us some, some level of control. However, uh, what, what seems to be happening in recent years is that enterprise data strategy has become more complex and it's really driven by three evolving and continuously evolving realities. One is the lowered barrier of entry for scalable high performance platforms, uh, especially when using cloud resources that don't have any capital acquisition costs and can be scaled up according to demand. So, so uh, a large number of organizations are looking at migrating their environment uh, to the cloud because it's it's lower cost and is more economically feasible. Number two is the available of low cost or more more frequently no cost open source tools that simplify the analytical process. And so so years ago when you had analysts, they were using you know particular types of of end user reporting and and, and BI tools. There were license constraints. There were limitations on availability of 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 uh, licensing to the desktop, you might have have uh, a need for particular types of expertise to be able to use these systems. Today, we've got all sorts of available tools that low cost, no cost that data consumers are able to configure on their own. And so we've got an increasing degree of, of, uh, uh, of sophistication of the data consumer co communities. And that leads into this third point, which is that that there's a broader array of personas that are positioned to derive value from information and analytics. So aside from your traditional data analysts and your business analysts, uh, you've got a, a number of different staff folks, team members with a range of skills that go from being, being basically a neophyte when it comes to data analysis, reporting and BI to expert data scientists who are who are you know knee deep and hands on with the data? They're all beneficiaries of the business intelligence reporting and analytics environments, and so the result turns into this virtuous cycle where you've got a greater demand for analytics, and that means modernizing the data strategy, and that means growing the enterprise data landscape. And growing the data landscape means there's greater numbers of data sources, and greater number of data pipelines, and a, and a much more diverse uh, distribution of the way that data is is stored, managed, access, flowed, piped across, across this, uh, th this more complex uh, uh, enterprise. And so when you get this increase in data sources and data pipelines, it inspires data downstream data consumers to be aware of more data sources, which makes them want to explore more ways that they can use the data to inform their decisions by creating new reports and new analyses and, and applying the data by di data scientists in different ways. So we get this, this kind of virtuous cycle where the more data that's available, the more demand there is for more data, which then continues to increase the complexity of that enterprise. Uh, and you know, the challenge here is that is that uh, it makes the environment more complex to support the the analytics demands because uh, and and this becomes an issue because as the the environment becomes more complex, uh, you've got this growing number of sophisticated data consumers. Each one of them now wants to exercise control over their own data pipelines. So instead of having the way we had used to have it in the traditional approach where you'd have an IT team that oversaw all of the 
all the uh, the progression and pipelines of, of that 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 extracted data from the sources, did the transformations and loaded the data into the target environment. Now you've got these different data consumers, and there's a, a much more you'd say distributed control uh, uh, over those environments where each downstream user may may be able to get access to data and and be able to to do their own data preparation, data engineering, and data data analysis. So you end up uh, with with this distribution of knowledge, but as a byproduct, you end up with diminishing data awareness because you've got an, a, a decrease in centralized authority and increased distributed authority, but then you also end up with a decreased uh, ability to, to centrally manage all the, the, the available resources and make, and make everyone in the enterprise aware of what the, those are. And this is not this is not an academic question. This is actually becomes a complicated problem, right? We started out by noting that we've known for decades that business decisions are enabled through reporting and, and analytics and business intelligence. And that relies on data awareness and data availability and data accessibility and trustworthiness and freshness and currency, et cetera. But when your data awareness is, is diminished, it introduces questions about the data that's being used for your BI or your reporting. And essentially that impairs the data consumers from the best use of analytics. So, so instead of enabling those data consumers, the, the, the increase in, in, in uh, complexity and distribution of data and the growing complex uh, uh, inter inter inter-network of data pipelines actually ends up reducing the effectiveness of business intelligence and reporting because it throttles the ability to, to, uh, to, to enable those end, 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 end data consumers. So uh, to enable informed decision-making and accelerate responsiveness, uh, analysts, data analysts or data consumers have to be aware of you know, what data sets are available and what data sets can be used and under what circumstances it can be used and how's the data sourced and how the data transformed between the origination points and when it's been delivered into some kind of report or some kind of visualization or whether that's been forwarded in a particular format to, to a, uh, a, 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 an analytical uh, uh, application uh, what are the dependencies that exist across the organization with respect to these data sources? Uh, you know, essentially asking asking these these key questions that are that I've got on you know, bullet points on the slide here is essentially can I trust the data that's made available to me? Uh, how are those how are those data sources or how are reports impacted by changes? in the environment or a change to a data source. And then the third is, is, is can I get the data that I need at the right time? Uh, but when you think about it, you actually can re reflect on this a little bit differently in that we can put these questions a little bit in a different way because, because when you ask the question in this way, it's really thinking about it as if the end consumer is not part of the process. But in reality, uh, when we start looking at at how the end users are integrated directly into the those dis, those increasing number of data pipelines, you have to then turn this these questions a little bit on their side and say, well, wait a second, it's not necessarily about can I trust the data in the warehouse, but rather how can I examine the data pipelines that are feeding the data into my application to which to allow me to feel confident that I can trust the data that's being made available to me or or a, a second the second question it's it's under different what if scenarios how can I determine how the different reports that I look at are going to be impacted if there were some change to the source data or if there were some change to the data model of the source, or even if there were some change to the circumstances under which the data in the source uh, is collected, or some change to a policy that 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 makes a modification to the way data is being collected and then subsequently uh, propagated. Uh, and then the third question: Am I getting the data that I need at the right time? It's 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 a different way of looking at it. At that is what are the best methods for optimizing the data pipelines in the environment 
to ensure that that I get the data that's most current and most trustworthy and uh, 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 in the right in the right time frame, but that it doesn't diminish from any other analyst's ability to get access to the data that they need at the right time? Are there ways that we can look at how the different data pipelines are configured to be able to uh, to be able to uh, uh, facilitate enablement of of data delivery in a way that is trustworthy, is not impacted in ways that we don't understand, and can be optimized so that everybody in the organization gets what they need uh, at the right time in the right in the right way, and 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 essentially also provided with the right degree of of exposure so that there's you know, protections and those types of things. So from, from a logical perspective, what we're looking at in terms of informed decision-making is that, is that we require data awareness and that data awareness is not just uh, being able to look at, at a simple enumeration of data sets and a list of the data elements that are in those data sets, but rather having, having increased visibility into into how the data elements that are that are being made available to me in the formats that they are being made available, how are they produced? And so here, the, it, it's no longer just a question of metadata. So, so in the in the past, if you came and asked these questions ten years ago, the answer would have been, well, you need a metadata repository. But but in fact, a metadata repository is is only part of the answer. It's actually if we look at data lineage. Data lineage is really the answer, and data lineage methods uh, uh, are the, are are intended to help develop a map uh, or a usable map of how information flows across the enterprise. And these methods help help uh, uh, map out the landscape, provides a holistic description of each data object that exists within the organization that is being used as a source at some point to any of the downstream consumers uh, artifacts. So the data object sources, the pipelines through which data is flowed, uh, the transformations that are being applied to data elements uh, or combination of data elements along the way, the methods of access of those data objects and the data elements within those, the controls that are imposed basically any other fundamental aspect of information use or information utility. And so data lineage is combining different aspects of corporate metadata. The first one would be the production lineage, which is the semantic aspects of tracing how data elements values are produced. And, and an example of this is, is uh, and this is an interesting example, I think, because people don't usually think about a report as being a an object that is subject to to metadata but when you look at a report and you see that there is a field on a report and there is a, a a column and then there is a value these are not uh, persistent typically these are produced values but they are still data elements and those data elements are 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 at the end of that production line and so, so there's a there's an actual semantic uh, uh, interpretation of of what that data element is that is based on how it was produced. And so, if you are able to get get uh, get some visibility into into the production change for that particular data element, that gives you insight as to what is actually being re represented in that in that 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 component of that report or that 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 bar chart and the visualization or that, that result of some kind of analysis. So the second type of, of data lineage, or metadata that's associated with data lineage is the technical lineage, which is the structural aspects of that data element uh, as they are produced, consumed, extracted, propagated across the enterprise. And so it's not just the flow, it's also what happens to that data element as it moved along the way. And then the third piece of this, is what we would call the procedural data lineage, uh, which is a trace of the journey through the different systems and the data stores that gives you essentially an audit trail. So if you looked, if you looked at this audit trail of the changes along the way, it would give you visibility to be able to answer the types of questions that, that we're asking in, in the prior slide, which is 
can I trust the data in the data warehouse? Well, if I can see what the meaning is that is that is based on the composition of that data element through the, the, the way it progressed from its original source or sources and transformations to the delivery point, then I can then I can I can get a level of assurance that I can trust the data in the data warehouse. Uh, or the second question being being uh, how is a report impacted by a change to a data source? Well, I'd like to be able to trace what the what the relationships are and the dependencies are from the data source to the points in the different reports where that data is is uh, is is essentially employed or used and then am i getting the data that i need at the right time if i've got if i've got this visibility into the procedural lineage and i can look at whether there's there are any any inadvertent delays introduced into the way that those those data values are being produced that will let me know whether there's there's any potential for the introduction of a delay that could impact data freshness or data currency uh, uh, within that process. And so lineage actually gives you visibility in multiple ways uh, and yet needs to be addressed in, across multiple dimensions. And we're gonna look at, at some perspectives on how data lineage has changed over time. And it's kind of interesting, you know, I reflect back on some of the work that I had done uh, 20 years ago with respect to data quality that, that looked at being able to trace lineage of the process flow of the production of data that went into an end user uh, report and end user uh, analysis. The, the issue though was 20 years ago, if you wanted to have data lineage, it had to be manual. You had to manually walk through your processes and document the metadata and document the dependencies and, and, and manually manage that. Uh, what was uh, uh, emergent re relatively recently in what I would call the second generation data lineage tools was simple automation for being able to do things like creating a data inventory or harvesting metadata and then inferring some system to system dependencies, which really tells you at a very global level, which systems touched which data elements in which, in which data sets. So you can tell that, that a system read a value or wrote a value and even be able to give some kind of visual representation and, and a bridge or an interface to a data catalog. But, uh, and, and this takes you, gets you part of the way there. This tells you a little bit about, about the, you know, the data awareness and the data availability. And it does give you some potential for uh, inferring dependencies uh, be on the data elements, but it doesn't really give you that, that the depth that is necessary for being able to, uh, uh, to be able to get, get in the level of insight that's necessary uh, uh, to be able to answer those questions the right way. But the emerging, I'll call it the bleeding edge tools. Uh, and I would, I would group uh, what Octopi, Octopi's brief me on, on their XD uh, the data lineage XD and and these are essentially the things that they've they've incorporated into their new release and I'm sure David Bennett is going to elaborate on in greater detail but but lineage of data elements across different systems transformations from source to target or between system column or dependencies or basically cross system lineage that shows how data flows from the origination point through the data pipelines to the different reports and analyses that are delivered to the data consumers uh, it provides column lineage that shows transformations that are applied to data elements from the source to the delivery point, and then inner system lineage that documents details of the production of data elements within the specific uh, system context. So, so I'm sure we're going to get some more some more details on that uh, when I hand it over to David. Uh, but to kind of uh, cycle back, you know, we talked a little bit before about the level of data architecture complexity and how how uh, there's a need for automation. If we're trying to do this in a manual way, it's, it's essentially, it's, it's, it, is, it is undoable manually. Organizations are continuing to expand their data landscape across on-prem and cloud platforms. The complexity of, this, of these, these data strategies means that manual oversight and manual management of data lineage is going to be difficult, if not impossible. And so organizations are gonna need tools that automatically infer and capture and manage and provide a visual presentation that, that is intuitive to the data consumers that provides details into this multi-dimensional data lineage. And, and the implications are here is that the manual capture is difficult. 
it's time consuming and worse, worse it's error prone. Uh, automated capture and management of lineage is going to provide trustworthy details about the data origin, the transformations, and those dependencies across the enterprise. Uh, and so, you know, we'll come back to the to the theme of today's talk: data lineage accelerates BI responsiveness because it informs these processes and requirements things for like integrated auditing for regulatory compliance or impact analysis to assess how code or model modifications impact data pipelines. Uh, or uh, replication of data pipeline segments for, for, for optimization or root cause analysis. And uh, access to these different dimensions allows data consumers to know what report data elements are available and how are they produced and what dependencies exist on the original sources and what transformations were applied. And we can look at an example use case. Uh, and and this, is, this is timely and relevant. You know, we've got these data privacy laws that are intended to prevent against exposure of sensitive data, and that's typically engineered into a bunch of different applications. Uh, but you know, here's the issue: if you look at some of these, some of these laws, the laws are change over time. Where the you know perhaps the definition of private data is included or is expanded to include a data element that previously had not been included. So so if you've got this this constraint where where you've got you know multiple systems that are depending on on, on analyzing data and all of a sudden the law changes that says some data element in the source is no longer available unless you have a particular uh, 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 right to view that data. How would I know where in the environment I need to make a change? Uh, uh, the answer, you know, what processes are impacted, what reports are impacted, what systems or what code needs to be reviewed and updated. And data lineage provides this visibility for doing impact analysis. The cross-system lineage allows you to identify which systems are impacted by modification to that externally defined policy. Uh, it'll tell you uh, when you modify the use or the rules associated with a particular source data element, what systems are touching that data element and how are they touching it. So you can determine, you know, if you look at the column lineage, it'll show you what the rec dependencies need to be reviewed. And the inner system lineage will expose where there's internal data dependencies that might inadvertently expose that that data that is now uh, has been modified to uh, to be incorporated into that definition of private data. So this is just just an example of of a use case, and and there's multiple use cases about how data lineage can be used in different ways. So, uh, what do we want to look for when we're looking for a data lineage solution? Well, well. You have to look at this from the, the practical perspective. Again, data lineage is a tool. It's used in different ways by different processes. I gave you, you know, one example. Uh, there's a bunch of other examples for the data analyst. A data lineage is going to provide insight into semantics and meanings of data elements that are available for developing a report or, or producing some kind of analysis. For a data engineer, data lineage gives you details about the pipelines and cross-system dependencies. Uh, a BI developer might rely on lineage to track down issues that are affecting the development of, a, of, of an artifact. A data scientist might want to examine different methods that other data scientists use to prepare data for, for their analyses to see if there's any opportunities for, for replication that would speed up the, the result. An application system developer might want to see how changes to policies or models need to be addressed across the enterprise. So you need to understand you know, how to look for the right capabilities that will address all these different use cases for all these different types of consumers. So I've kind of boiled it down to these four categories. When you want to look for a data lineage tool, uh, consider these, these four different facets, right? Breadth is, uh, is you want to be able to have a, a details about the, the, the breadth of how information flows across your enterprise. When lineage is limited to a system to system data flow that doesn't show the finer details about intercom dependencies or what transformations are being applied uh, during each processing stage, that's not going to be able to satisfy the needs of these, the different personas that we just talked about. So look for tools that, that are, give you this description of the lineage across those, those different dimensions. Uh, going clockwise, automation. Again, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I don't think I can emphasize this more. Any attempt to do this manually is, is doomed to be error prone. So uh, you really want to, you know, if you rely on manual capture and management, that's going to be time consuming. It's going to be error prone. Uh, automation is going to remediate these issues. Uh, the third 
is visualization. You've got to have an intuitive method for providing the right level of detail and a visualization to each type of, of persona, especially as your, your, the number of data pipelines increases and the complexity of those pipelines grow. I mean, if you recall, if we look at, at the, the e, 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 continually evolving complexity of, of our data landscapes, uh, you, you'll see that, that, that relying on something that is, that is not giving you the right level of detail is, uh, depending on who, you're, who the consumer is, is going to, is going to to impact their ability to make good decisions about how to, to address their particular use cases. And then finally, integration. Uh, again, uh, data lineage is a tool, but it's a tool among an arsenal of other tools. And data lineage tools need to integrate with other, these other tools and utilities, especially if you want to be able to automatically derive the lineage information. So look for products that are engineered to integrate with other complementary products. And with that, uh, if you've got questions, uh, I think Shannon's uh, already told us about how to how to uh, share questions. If uh, you think of one after after the fact, uh, you can contact me at either my uh, my knowledge integrity email or my University of Maryland email, and I'm going to hand it back to uh, to Shannon to introduce David. Yes, thank you, David Lotion. And so, David, if you want to share your screen to start your side of the webinar. And if you have questions for either David, you may submit them in the Q&A section, which you can find in the bottom middle of your screen for that icon. And we will get to the Q&A at the end of the presentation. David, take it away. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, uh, David, uh, for an uh, interesting uh, presentation. So I'm very excited to be here today and uh, to be able to actually introduce you to Octopi's Data Lineage XD, which is actually the first platform on the market to provide advanced multi-dimensional views of data lineage. All right, so what is multi-dimensional uh, views of lineage? So first of all, we have cross-system lineage, which provides you end-to-end -end lineage at the system level from the entry point into the BI landscape, all the way to the reporting and analytics. So this level provides high level visibility into the data, data flow, and it also maps where data is coming from and where it's going. Secondly, we have inner system lineage, which details the column level within an ETL process, for example, a report, a database object, and so on. Understanding the logic and data flow from each column provides visibility at the column level. So no matter how complex the process, report, or object is. And then there's finally end-to-end -end column lineage, which details the column-to-column -column level lineage between systems from the entry point into the BI landscape and all the way through to the reporting and analytics. So now what I'd like to do is jump into a demo and show you the power of Data Lineage XD with an actual use case. So bear with me, and we should be able to jump into the Octopi demo environment. All right, so what I'd like to do is, uh, again, like show you this in uh, a use case. Imagine now that you have uh, a support ticket that was issued by a business user. It could be the uh, the CFO, Mr. or Mrs. CFO, and might, let's say it's uh, the end of a quarter, and uh, the report that they're basing their business, uh, their quarterly results on, there's something wrong with it, which is, of course, a common scenario that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So... In order to try to figure out what went wrong with that report, you're going to need to understand how the data landed on. In order to do that, it's going to require reverse engineering. And of course, that's going to be done in most organizations today that are not using Octopi. It will be done with a lot of manual work, which is going to be very time consuming. And as David mentioned, inefficient. And it will also introduce some uh, other production issues as well. Now, this would not be the case with Octopi. Let's go ahead and see how Octopi would address that challenge. So. Octopi will search through all of your various systems in order to gather the metadata uh, that we need. Now, what we see here on uh, our dashboard is uh, actually the Octopi uh, dashboard. On the left-hand side, we see here a sampling in our demo environment of some different ETLs from uh, SSIS and also from uh, SQL Server as stored procedures. In the middle, what we see here are of, co are, of course, the different database objects, tables, and views. And that is, of course, coming from, uh, from SSAS, SQL Server, and as well, some textual files. To the right of that, we see the different reports and the reporting systems. So now in order to investigate this error in this report, most BI teams will go through a very similar scenario, which is they'll probably start off by investigating the structure of the report and the reporting system. 
After that, everything will need to be mapped. And then they'll probably need to contact the DBA to ask some questions such as which tables and views were involved in the creation of that report if they don't know themselves. Now, they also might go in and take a look at the fields and labels to see if they were given the same names. And if not, which glossary was used. Now, even after investigating everything at this level, which is of course the most common or, or makes sense because the error is here, going to take a step back to see first if the error crept in there. Now, even after investigating everything here, our DBA may be kind enough to tell us there's actually nothing wrong at this level. And you may need to look in at the ETL level. So you're going to need to take a step backwards, start investigating, of course, that at that level. And of course, it's going to be a very similar process. Now, in most organizations, in order to do that kind of investigation, if you're lucky, it may take an hour or two if it's a very simple scenario. If it's more complicated than that, than that it may take a day or two. And we even have scenarios is where our customers are telling us it sometimes takes weeks and even months, depending, of course, on the complexity. So that's a fair synopsis of how that would be handled uh, in most organizations today. What I'd like to do now is actually show you how that would be addressed uh, within Octopi, literally in seconds and automatically. So the trouble we're having with is in a report called customer product. So I'm going to type that in in our lineage module. And as I type that in, Octopi will filter through the entire environment showing me the report that we're having trouble with. So now what I'm gonna start off is actually by showing you a cross system lineage. So I'm simply gonna click on that. And about a second later, we have a complete understanding at the cross system level of how the data landed on that report. Now, I've increased the, um, the legend on the left-hand side so you can actually see what we're taking a look at. So on the right-hand side over here, what we have is the actual report we're having a trouble with that our CFO complained about. As I move to my left, I can now see how that report was created. And we can see here that there was at least one view involved in the creation of that report. As I continue to move to my left, you see here there's another view and a few different tables that were also involved in the creation of that report. Now, if I click on any item on the screen, I get a radio dial that comes up, which gives me more options. Now, just for, uh, for uh, I guess, for argument's sake, or just to give you another example of how we can help, is if you needed to make a change to this table and wanted to know what the impact would be, Imagine what you would have to do today in order to get that information with Octobyte, simply clicking on uh, the button there. And we now see the dependent objects, of course, at a high level, what would be impacted should we make changes to that one table? And of course, that would be the same to any object on the screen. So as we continue to move left, we hear finally, we find the ETL that was involved in the creation of that report. In this demo environment, there's one ETL and many organizations that we're dealing with are actually using multiple different systems to manage and move their data. And if that's the case in your organization, it's not a challenge for Octopi. We can still show you the path that the data has taken in order to get or land on that report. Now, as we pushed our customer further in this scenario, we actually asked what went wrong with this report. And they admitted that a few weeks earlier before they had started using Octopi, they had made changes to this one ETL over here. And most likely that's why they're facing production issues today. So we asked them, of course, if they knew that whenever they make a change, there would be impacts. Why not look into, you know, be proactive, look into the impact that those changes would, would have on the, on the, on the environment, or on the system, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the data pipeline. And of course, uh, make the corrections and save all of the production issues, the data quality issues that arrive and the resulting um, um, confidence in the data and so on. And of course, as David said, it's it's basically undoable in most organizations because there's just too much to look into. There could be hundreds, if not thousands, or even tens of thousands of different objects that could be affected, different ETLs, tables, views, and reports, and so on that could be affected by any one change to any one object on the, uh, in the environment, such as a table view or, or an ETL. Yeah, so, of course, since organizations are forced to be reactive, they, that's because the only way that uh, they, they can work, they, of course, they will try to make changes without making any production issues using the capabilities at hand, such as, you know, the knowledge of the people on the team, if they're all still there and they haven't left the organization, maybe some spreadsheets, hopefully they're kept up to date. If not, you know, they'll deal with it. And then, of course, all using all of that. They'll make those changes, maybe holding their fingers crossed and, and a little bit of a prayer and then eight or nine times out of 10, there will probably be no production issues. And then the one or two times out of 10 that there are production issues because they're forced to react, they will have to actually react to those issues. And the problem with that is you're only reacting to what you know of. What you don't know of, of course, continues to snowball and create all kinds of havoc throughout the environment. Now, of course, with Octopi, we can change that. We can turn that on its head. We can now empower you to become more efficient and proactive. And actually, before you make a change, you can actually now understand what would be impacted should you make a change uh, within the environment. So let's say like this customer, however, we were using Octopi, we needed to make a change to this ETL, a simply click of the mouse, 
and click on lineage, we now understand exactly what would be impacted should we make changes to that one ETL. And so what we see here is something quite interesting because if you guys remember, the reason why we started this entire search or uh, 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 root cause or impact analysis search is because of course, we had one business user complain, although it was Mr. or Mrs. CFO, we had them complain about one report. And so as far as we knew, of course, ignorance is bliss. That was the only report affected. Now, however, that we take a look at the lineage of this ETL, we can actually probably 100, be 100% certain that most likely that is not going to be the end of the, uh, uh, of, of the scenario. Most likely that some, if not all of these different objects on the screen could have been affected or would have been affected by any change to this one ETL. So of course, you know, these different ETLs, stored procedures, views, uh, of course, um, sorry, there we go, views. And then of course, these uh, measure groups, dimensions, tables and views, and of course, reports could have been affected. So most likely what will then continue to happen in a real reality is that as these reports get opened, you hope that those business users that are going to be opening those reports are going to actually notice the errors in them. Because if they don't, it's going to be worse. Now they're going to actually open support tickets. Now these reports will be open throughout the year by different people within the organization with different job functions, of course. And of course, since they're open throughout the year by different people at different times and those support tickets are open uh, at different times throughout the year, there's just no way humanly possible that those who are responsible for trying to fix those errors could know that there is one root cause. So what will happen is, as we said earlier, they're going to start to reverse engineer those reports, which could take anywhere from hours, days, or even longer. And you can probably know better than I how much time and effort is wasted through uh, throughout the year trying to reverse engineering those reports, because, of course, it's not going to be uh, limited to uh, six or eight or ten. It's probably going to be hundreds. Now, of course, I said wasted because if they had known, the BI team or those responsible for correcting had known from the get-go that this ETL was the root cause, and they wouldn't have had to reverse engineer all of those reports to try to get to that root cause. Now, I left these two here on the side, then that is to prove a point, and that is if you're working re reactively, manually, most likely uh, you will get to most of the errors in most of uh, the reports or in the system, but not all. And so some of these reports will fill, fall through the cracks. They will continue to be used by the organization. And then, of course, the organization will make business decisions based on those reports, which is going to be, of course, the most impactful of the two. So, so far, what we've shown you to, uh, up till now is a, uh, a uh, impact, uh, a root cause analysis, and then we jumped into an impact analysis, of course, at the cross-system uh, level, and now what I'm going to do is jump into the inner system to show you inner system lineage. So, let's take a look at this uh, SSIS pa package. Maybe you need to make a change to this ETL, and you want to see the impact at the column level. So, let's go ahead and uh, click on the SSIS package and choose package view. So here we see, of course, one, uh, one package as it's, as it's a demo environment. So of course, your production environment, if you, you're using SSIS, most likely will have multiple packages. And of course, you would see them here. So now let's delve into the container. By double clicking here, I'm going to delve into the container. And let's take a look at the logics, uh, logic sorry, and transformations that take place within one of these processes. So I'm going to take dim product, double click it. And now it will take me to a column to column level at in the inter, inter uh, system level. And what we can see here is a source to target. So now let's say uh, if you'd like to see the entire journey from source to target, including the transformations and logic, of course, that happen within a, uh, a specific column, you simply now choose the column that you'd like to get to. You might not be able to see it, but there are three dots that pop up onto the right of that. If I click on that, that will now take us to a end-to-end column-to-column lineage. So now um, if what you'd like to see is the entire journey. What you're seeing here is from source to target or at the column level. Now we can also show you as well from the column level, we can jump into the table level, schema level, and DB level. Now, of course, all of this is integrated. So if you need to jump further into any one of these um, um, uh, objects on the screen, for example, if I needed to go backwards now to cross system lineage, I can come black and now go back into the cross system lineage. And so that was <clears throat> everything that I had to show you here today. Of course, there are other dimensions to Octopi's platform that I haven't shown you here today. We have, of course, data discovery, we have a business catalog, which is actually called an automated business catalog, or business glossary, ABG. 
And of course, there may be, um, of course, other questions. And if you'd like to see more about Octopi, of course, you can get in touch with us. And we, of course, we'd be happy to arrange a more in-depth uh, demo and presentation. Back to you, Shannon. Thank you so much for this great demo and information. And thanks to both of you for this great presentation. Again, if you have questions for, for either David, um, feel free to submit it in the Q&A section of your screen to find the Q&A panel, just click that in the bottom middle. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, just to note, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday Pacific time um, with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation. So, and if you see in the Q&A uh, section that somebody's already asked the question that you like, just hit that little thumbs up uh, button to escalate that uh, and to uh, dive in here. So, uh, which, uh, so it, this came in with David Lotion when you were talking, you know, with the same information um, being used across the enterprise for various purposes, would you address the, any ethical implications that may be overlooked or not considered? So I'm not really 100% sure I understand uh, what you mean by ethical considerations, although I do think that an example might be uh, the the determination that there is an a, a an unauthorized approach used to combine data from multiple uh, 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 origination points that results in exposing information that probably should not be exposed. So that might be an example where I can make uh, I, I we can automate the inferencing of of characteristics associated with, say, a customer based on data that's being pulled from multiple sources in a way that it shouldn't be used. So that I would assume that would be a good example of a use case uh, for, for lineage because you're able to see how data sets are being blended and being fused for, uh, 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 for, for, for downstream use. But if, if you wanna go back to the, to the Q and A and type in a clarification, maybe we can cycle back on that question. Sure. Um, Shannon, and, yes, can you hear uh, me? So I see a question here that I wanted to answer if you don't mind. Uh, okay. So I see a question here um, by one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the attendees. It says, "I see uh, de the demo uses Microsoft tools to find uh, end -to -end, uh, tools for end-to-end -end lineage. What other reporting or other tools do we support?" So, if you don't mind, I'd just like to uh, answer that question. Uh, Octopi has actually the most extensive list of supported systems, not just, of course, Microsoft. What you can see here is currently what we do support, plus what is in our roadmap. You can simply find that on our website under octopi.com supported technologies. But to give you an example, there's ADF, Azure Data Factory, Natiza, Teradata, SQL, of course, Amazon Redshift was on the way, uh, Vertica, Power BI, um, Click, MicroStrategy, Cognos, and of course, we have many more coming. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Shannon, go ahead. Sure, yeah, lots of good questions coming in here about Octopi. So uh, in fact, speaking of, you know, does Octopi work within SAP to collect lineage information? So within SAP, we do not uh, collect um, a lineage. However, we do support um, SAP BO as a, a reporting systems and we can provide a uh, lineage to and from it. Hello? Yeah, so what is uh, Octopi's enterprise pricing? Okay, so that is a question that would uh, be a little bit more difficult to answer in a form like this, but I can give you an understanding of how it's priced. It's certainly not by user. Everybody within the organization can have access to Octopi and uh, gain benefit to uh, using Octopi or from using Octopi, and that includes also our business glossary, so everyone on the business side can also have access to it. The way we do price Octopi is, uh, like I said, not through user. It is by module. Depending on the module today, I showed you one module. There are other modules within Octopi and metadata source. Ballpark uh, is anywhere from around $3,000 to $10,000 per month total, all in. There are no uh, limitations basically on anything. It includes training, uh, upgrades, maintenance. And so on that, it is, of course, in a, um, in a uh, annual license or an annual contract. And what was the uh, initial information created in Octopi? 
Uh, I'm sorry, repeat the question again. Yeah, what was the initial information created in your demo there? Okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. Maybe it's asking how did it, how did it boot boot uh, bootstrap the uh, uh, the collection of information? That's how so, I'm inferring the. the yeah, yeah. Collection. Okay, I, I might have understood that as well. So, how do we collect the uh, the data, uh, the metadata? So it's very simply done. Um, it uh, there is an Octopi Thin client that we send to the client, the, cu the customer. The customer installs that once in their environment on any Windows system. They point that thin client to the various systems that we want to extract the metadata from. Of course, we provide with you with all the instructions on how to do that. That entire process on configuring the Octopi client to extract the metadata should take no more than one hour. It's done once. Once that's configured, you hit the run button. Octopi then goes ahead and extracts that metadata, saves it in, in XML format. Those XML files are saved locally. You can, of course, inspect them to take a look at them to ensure that they meet your security standards before you then upload those to the cloud where and then Octopi, uh, the Octopi services uh, is triggered. That's where all the magic happens, the, uh, the algorithms, the machine learning and the process power come to play to uh, analyze that metadata and then make it available to you in the form of lineage, discovery, and even a business glossary um, uh, to the business user via a web browser. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I believe so. And because, you know, there's a follow up to that, you know, how not only how is it initially, but uh, how does it keep up to date? Actually, a great, great point. That's something that I forgot to mention is that it, uh, it could, the entire process that I just mentioned can then be automated so that on a weekly basis, uh, you upload a new metadata to the cloud. It's analyzed and given to you um, so that you can see on a Monday morning, for example, you upload that on a Friday, Monday morning, you come back to work and you have a new version. And that works actually quite well with most organizations because development usually happens during the week, then uploaded to the cloud uh, and uploaded to production. And so Monday morning, you have a new fresh version. And while we're on that topic, you know, how do you handle lineage with uh, software as a service apps? Often we're leveraging extracts or APIs to access data from those apps. Uh, that's a good question. Well, I know that we don't support APIs, but I think I'm going to refer that uh, response to Amichai, my colleague who is on the line. Amichai? Yeah, sure. So we have different uh, methods of extracting metadata from all different uh, types of sources. And if in any case, this specific type of source is not supported for automation, there's always an option to augment different types of uh, lineage for uh, anything you have that wouldn't be supported. Perfect, I love it. So how can a tool like this be oper operationalized to work in an enterprise system like an EMR? Um, Amichai, I think that's what's for you. <laughs> can you repeat that again? Sure. Oh yeah. So, how can the tool, how can this, the, the data lineage XD, be operationalized to work in an enterprise system like an EMR? So, um, again, we, all the tools that we uh, support um, with automation is what um, David uh, showed and is available on our website. And in addition to that, there's always the option of augmenting additional lineage. So, to kind of get the complete full coverage if you have anything that's not supported. So I think here um, someone may have misunderstood me. Akim uh, Perdun had asked a question, no API integration. Um, yes, we do have APIs that can be called upon. So if you need to export everything or anything within Octopi, you can uh, use those APIs to be called upon and they can inject that metadata and the lineage into a third party application. We also have a direct integration with uh, some other uh, industry uh, systems as well. Awesome. So it, it is clear that there is a need for a comprehensive data lineage tool to learn and understand the semantic structure and process. How do you integrate the tool to the ecosystem and other products and utilities? Um, okay, I mean, hi, once again, I'm gonna get, re refer that one to you. Oh, you're there. Yeah. I, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so um, you know, the way, the way um, our tool integrates is basically the way um, David described before is that we actually connect to the different tools in the BI ecosystem. We pull metadata from those tools 
um, in, our, in, in uh, um, an automated way. And once we do that, we're completely away from the ecosystem. We do perform all the analysis that David uh, talked about on the side and make it available um, via the URL. I love all these questions about the product. Uh, lots of interest here. Uh, how does Octavite help in a distributed environment where data sets are extracted and used locally? So again, it really depends on the type of implementation. You would make use of all the different methods that we've been discussing so far. Um, it really just depends on the different type of environment that you have. And you know, there's a lot of um, questions here about data catalogs. Do you have any? Uh, do you connect to any other data catalogs, Calibra, IBM, if, uh, any others? Uh, so we have direct integration with Calibra. Um, I have, I see here a question, and as I mentioned earlier, we have APIs that can be called upon to integrate with others. We also are in talks with others um, to integrate directly with them. Um, there was a question about what uh, the data lineage at Octopi, that Calibra uh, delivers and uh, what Octopi does. The question is the use case. If uh, data governance use cases are the use cases that you're concerned with, then of course Calibra would be uh, well suited for that. If, it, if they are the use cases that would be involved in a BI landscape, such as uh, impact analysis, uh, reverse engineering a report, um, you know, um, and the various other scenarios that are uh, within the uh, BI, of course, Octopi would be more suited for that. And augmented data management is a concept catching up with clients. Do you see Octopi catering to that market as well? So I'm not familiar with that. I think uh, Amichai would might know a little bit more about that, but um, maybe you want to attempt that, Amichai? Again, I missed the first word. What was that? Augmented. Augmented, yeah. Augmented data management? Yeah. yeah. Augmented data management is a concept catching up with mm -hmm. clients. Do you see Octopi catering to that market as well? Yeah, well, they, they kind of um, complete each other um, in a way. Um, and Octopi as well is, uh, as I mentioned before, allows you to augment, augment lineage. But the, while you really enjoy the big benefit of the automation, whenever it's needed, um, that's also part of uh, what we offer. And there's a lot of questions here, you know, about what you, what other products you connect with and um, how you connect. Is there a link that we can get that I can send in the follow-up email that shows all the, that'd be. Yeah, if you can see here on my, uh, on my screen, that yeah. is the link to the currently supported systems. If you'd like, I can uh, send that to you afterwards or anybody can actually tell you. It's octopi.com slash supported dash technologies slash. Love it. Would you mind putting that in the chat for us, please? And then sure. I'll. I'll copy that over and include that in. Um, I love it. So, okay, I think we've got time for a couple more questions through here, at least one more. Um, is, it is it possible to include metadata from other governance tools um, into Lineage? For example, if cluster seven inventory of reports is described with lists of sources? Sorry, run that question where, run that question by me again? Sure. Oh, maybe yes. So I think the core of it is, you know, is it possible to include metadata from other governance tools uh, into the lineage? So that is a good question. It, it, it all depends. Um, if um, currently today Octopi is, supports the systems that I mentioned earlier, we do have augmented links, which we can actually uh, add for systems that are not supported on the list there. Uh, Amichai, did you have any other options possibly for, for that question there? Yeah, um, it, it, it of course depends on what type of metadata you have in those um, different tools. But yeah, there is an option to import um, different data assets from different tools into Octopi. All right. Uh, I think we do have time for one more. Uh, how might this be used to track data flows from discrete Internet of, uh, Internet of Things devices across multiple source channels? All right. So the way um, the way Octopi uh, works is um, we basically connect to the different data uh, pipelines and different data. Uh, um, elements, the, uh, the, the where, data warehouse, the reporting tools, and all of those. And we will pick up the, the metadata from those, um, from those places directly. 
So that's um, that, that's the way we uh, we kind of harvest the metadata and build the entire lineage. I love it. Well, that does bring us to the top of the hour. I'm afraid that is all the time we have. So many great questions about the product and interest. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday Pacific time with links to the slides and links to the recording uh, as well as the additional information requested here. Uh, thank you to everybody for all these great presentations and information. Thanks to Octopi for sponsoring today's webinar, helping making all these happen. And thanks to everybody who's been so engaged. Uh, we really appreciate it and hope you all have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.